So what is the design sprint really? It's a very good question, Dee. Thank you. But I thought you were teaching this course, shouldn't you know? Oh, uh, yeah, totally, totally know what I'm doing. I'll tell you anyway, <laughs> I'll tell you anyway, just for the benefit of the camera. The design sprint is a step-by-step, five-day system for solving big problems and testing big ideas. And it, really, it's being used a lot for building better products faster. It was developed at Google, first by Jake Knapp, the guy who actually wrote this book as a way to bring design into Google in a way that was measurable, in a way that was a little bit more logical and cold and specific than design thinking, which is a bit more open and um, let's say creative. For us at AJ and Smart, the reason why we started using the design sprint is just because it was such a simple and obvious way to start working on a product. So for us, it was like immediately took over the whole company and something we love, but it all started with this little baby blue book. Is that baby blue? Sky Blue, we used to really operate like a more standard, typical design consultancy agency, mm. doing like longer projects and, um, and, and customizing different types of work that we were doing for yeah. our customers and basing our work more on what our customers told us they thought they wanted more than um, doing what we, we knew. So we, we actually really changed uh, to the design sprint as a process that you can plug into any problem or any, any type of problem and run the process and really always make sure you're, you're validating ideas, make sure you're always solving these problems. So when we used to actually run more like an agency, we would see that we would have these kind of typical development processes. Like I'm sure most of you are really used to seeing these typical processes where, where there's this cycle of like starting with an idea, spending time designing and building and coming up with maybe multiple versions and then deciding which ones to do and then, then implementing and developing and building them maybe finally launching and then collecting information on what your, what customers really thought about the idea. Yeah, but and it's like this classic lean startup loop that was really trendy at the time where we thought, okay, we're going through this loop, so it must be the most efficient way to do things. But what we normally see, and when I'm teaching design sprints, always getting lots and lots of nods <laughs> with people when I bring this up, what you normally see in these processes is much more of uh, the implementation and the building phase stretching out longer and longer with miscommunications and misalignments and teams handing over and passing information back and forth from each other. The designers designing, the developers saying that won't work, let's go back to the drawing board. And the process usually ends up looking a lot more like this where you maybe don't even actually get to launch and don't ever even actually get to, to see that data and uh, find out if the idea was even worthwhile and valid in the first place and would actually have an impact on your business. Closing this loop and making this loop a lot smaller of validating and getting data of, of, uh, on a product or an idea before spending all this time is really what the design sprint is all about. And the design sprint 2.0, which is what we're going to be teaching, is doing all of this. The process we're about to teach you in four days instead of the original five that's in the book, which we've developed with Jake as well as this four day process. So what does the design sprint actually look like in practice? It, it is all about getting a group of people in the room, a mixed team of people, to work on an idea together all at the same time. So you get the right group of people in the room and clear their calendars for the whole week so that they can work together on this problem. And what does that week generally look like? On the first day, it's uh, creating a map together where everyone in the room can really understand the system that they're working with, the product or the service and how it works really getting a map together of, of, so everyone is aligned on understanding what they're working with and then sketching solution ideas that could really try and solve the problem that we're, the topic that we're dealing with at the time. And on the next day, the Tuesday, that's all about deciding which one of those multiple solutions could, or combination of those could be the thing that we really want to test and really want to try. And then drawing a storyboard that really uh, gives a concise view of what that uh, concept looks like, what that solution could look like and so that we can show it to people and test it with them. On the Wednesday, the third day, it's all about building that into a usable prototype, some, a very quick way of showing what that concept is so that people can actually use it and test it, whether that's a digital or a physical or non-digital prototype. And on the last day, where you actually line up five people that are the right kinds of people to test this new idea with and actually running through those tests. And then on the Friday, you have a free day where you can party, woo! We should probably just like reiterate the fact that this course that you're doing right now is based on the four day design sprint 2.0. 
In the book, if you've read it, it's based on five day, but the book is two years old. This is the updated version. So everything we're talking about from now on is about the four day design sprint, okay? And you get the same results. It's actually more efficient. So just so you know. So this can be really, really helpful for people who want to run sprints in their organization that you need the experts and the people with the knowledge. It could be the product manager, the CEO, marketing manager. You only need them in the room for a shorter amount of time for two days maximum. So this can really help make sprints more efficient and actually be able to run them. And easier to sell easier. as well. Yeah, easier to convince people to, to do them and spend that yeah. time. Okay, so maybe I'll just give your voice a little break there, Dee. Uh, Thanks, John. <laughs> and go through some of the core principles. Now, these are some things that you're going to hear repeated over and over again during the design sprint process. And these are the almost like the pillars of every exercise that you're going to be running in the design sprint. So the first thing is that we're going to be working together, but alone. It sounds sad, but it's not sad. <laughs> in a normal design process, what happens, or even in a normal meeting when you're trying to build a product, everyone's talking at the same time, everyone's arguing, everyone's putting their solutions out on the table. There's a lot of talking, there's a lot of collaborating. And even though maybe it kind of feels good in the moment, it's pretty inefficient. What happens usually is that the people who are really good at sales pitches or the people who are really loud or the people who are really confident generally are able to get their ideas through a little bit better than people who are maybe a little more shy. But it could be those shy people who could have some of the best solutions. So what you do with the design sprint is that everybody works towards the same goal, but without sharing, a lot, most of the time, without sharing what they're working on, um, especially when it comes to the solutions everybody works on the solutions by themselves and later things come together. So there's a lot of silence in the design sprint and it can feel pretty weird. And that's why we usually have a soundtrack playing during the quieter exercises of the sprint. And that soundtrack, we're also gonna link to you somewhere here. Uh, if you just search AJ and Smart on, on Spotify, you'll find that as well. So together alone is a huge one. And it's something as a facilitator that's worth pointing out at the very start of the sprint as well, just to give people the idea, look, we're gonna be working together, but we're not going to be discussing with each other, right? It removes the bias of the discussion. The second thing is, when we do have some sort of a discussion, we want to have something tangible to show for that discussion. That's why you'll see whenever there is any sort of open discussion happening in the sprint, we're usually pointing at something or we're usually referring to something, right? We're not just talking about and describing something that's not there. In the lightning demos, we're showing the demos during the um, voting for the concepts, we're looking at the concepts. There's never any discussion without being able to show something tangible to guide that discussion. I love this one because it's about uh, removing the different interpretations that people might have. When you're just describing something, you're using words and people might have a different picture in their minds of what you're actually talking about. But when you have something to really show, you're all seeing the same thing. This is why there's so much putting things up on walls and making, really making things tangible that everyone can see the same thing in the sprint. Yeah. So next one is getting started is more important than being right. You're going to hear us mention this a lot during the training or versions of it. And the goal here is to keep in mind that moving forward, getting started and just getting going from one exercise to the next is actually more important than making sure that each of these exercises and each of these decisions that you're making are perfectly correct. The sprint is about moving fast. It's about gathering momentum and stopping to always second guess whether you're correct or not is gonna kill that momentum. So during the course, we're also gonna be teaching you a couple of ways to make sure that you break through uh, those barriers when people really wanna be right and really uh, don't want to move on to the next step. This is a really tough one as a facilitator, but we're gonna give you all of our tricks on how to keep people moving and how, how to help people let go of things that they might feel like are getting lost yeah. along the way. For only two ninety nine dollars extra. <laughs> no. That's a joke. Okay, so Great finally, job, thanks for the joke, thank you, thank you. <laughs> the last thing is that you don't want to rely on creativity. Now, one thing I wanna say about these slides, what I just realized that some people are gonna point out, all these slides are made in Comic Sans. N no, more com <laughs> no more comments to that, it's just true. Okay, so don't rely on creativity. Here's the scenario. You come into the office on Monday morning. This is, this is our scenario. We have a new client, a new industry. Maybe we're tired. Maybe we're, someone's a little bit sick. Maybe you're just not feeling very creative. For the sprint to work, you don't need to rely on individual creativity. You don't need to rely on people feeling in the mood to be creative. 
the system allows for creativity. So that's something super important also to explain to people, especially who may not be comfortable in a creative environment, that they do not need creativity to get through the sprint. And to have a great outcome in the sprint as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So the sprint will give you the framework to produce solutions that are going to be useful and going to be maybe even perceived as creative, but creativity is not part of this process. So don't worry about it. Those are the most important principles to keep in mind. And I'll just really quickly repeat them again. Together alone, tangible is more important than discussion. Getting started is more important than being right. And don't rely on creativity. So that's the design sprint in a pretty big nutshell. <laughs>